Please, dear colleagues, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to who is with us on WebEx and to who is now joining us on Facebook Live. The Geneva Environment Network has the pleasure to welcome you today virtually for a high level dialogue on plastic governance, closing the first series of the Geneva Bit Plastic Pollution Dialogues, organized in collaboration with the Basel, Rotterdam, and Stockholm Convention Secretariat, the Center for International Environmental Law, the Global Governance Center at the Graduate Institute, and the governments of Norway and of Switzerland. For those who wouldn't yet know our platform, we are a network of more than 100 institutions and secretariats based in Geneva that makes this region one of the global hubs for environmental governance. Administrated by the United Nations Environment Programme and supported by Switzerland, we organize various networking activities, including regular multi-stakeholder roundtables and briefings on major environmental trends. This session will be moderated by Bruno Pozzi, the Director for Europe of the United Nations Environment Programme, who will be introducing our guests throughout the event. Before I give him the floor, let me remind you that the video of this event and the presentations made, as well as a summary, will be available online on the webpage of this event. You can raise your questions in the Q&A box throughout the event, and we will address them in the last part of this session. For who is with us on WebEx, once the event is closed, if you wish, you can remain online uh, with us for a virtual coffee. Bruno, over to you. Thank you so much, Diana, and I hope that everyone can hear me. I see you nodding, so that's the case. Wonderful. Thank, thank you so much, and let's uh, let me let me welcome you to this uh, 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 high-level session of the Geneva Beat Plastic Pollution. Geneva Beat Plastic Pollution Dialogues, apologies. And and really uh, uh, great that we have such a high level panel with us uh, to conclude a, a, a number of meetings that have started uh, in Geneva and online uh, last November. As we know, colleagues, the world is uh, facing a plastic crisis and the status quo is not an option. Uh, initiatives uh, have or are being developed to tackle uh, this incredible environmental problem and uh, some of them have been featured in the dialogues uh, that uh, we've had since November, as I was saying, Be because uh, there is one fact that we cannot deny and that's why we find we try to find solution. The fact is that we are unable to cope with the amount of plastic that we generate and therefore action is needed. The plastic crisis has become part of international discussion in all uh, UN and international fora and in all dimensions of the crisis and therefore including in Geneva where actors are engaged in rethinking the way we manufacture, we use, we trade, we manage plastics. So this is with this in mind that the Geneva Beat Plastic uh, Pollution Dialogues were launched with the support of the Geneva Environment Network and uh, the aim of this dialogue was to create synergies among actors to better highlight uh, the ongoing processes as we were going to UNR 5.1 and you know uh, this uh, UN Environment Assembly uh, first leg of the fifth one was held virtually two weeks ago and UNR 5 opens a number of global environmental negotiations that will take place in this year and the next. So, so it was an important moment to, to, to build here in Geneva uh, awareness and dialogue around this session. So we've had a collaboration with the Basel, Rotterdam and Stockholm Convention uh, Secretariat, with the Centre for International Environmental Law, with the Global Governance Centre at the Graduate Institute, but also uh, Norway and Switzerland, and let me thank again Switzerland as well for the support, uh, which is really strong to the Geneva Environment Network at all time. These dialogues uh, led to seven sessions where, we, where a number of recommendations were made leading to this high level dialogue today. And over 500 attendees uh, joined one or more of these dialogues, while a thousand uh, people uh, watched and looked at the outcomes of the session on the GEN website. Among uh, these, uh, those who joined or watched these videos, uh, representatives from over 100 countries, 15 different UN agencies and specialized agencies, joined one or more dialogues. And we had, of course, a large number of uh, civil society representatives, NGOs, business organizations, private sector, 
think tank and universities also attending. So this is really uh, something, a journey that comes to not an end, but to a, a first conclusion today. And it is really a pleasure to see that we could mobilize so many uh, uh, goodwill and efforts uh, throughout uh, the, the four months of this journey. Now, with this being said, I think we're going to go into roughly a, a small hour of discussion. And I would like first to invite my colleague and uh, friend Susan Gardner, who is Director for Ecosystems at the UN Environment Programme, to set the scene, the general context uh, after UNEA 5.1 and looking beyond. Uh, Susan, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Bruno. Um, Alice is going to help me to put some slides on. Um, and I'm really pleased to have the chance to provide some opening remarks. Um, you know, as you mentioned, Bruno, since last month's UNEA 5, uh, it was so significant that the Environment Assembly agreed with the need to address the three planetary crises of climate, nature and biodiversity loss, and pollution. And marine litter and plastic pollution contribute to all three. Um, so this work and this conversation right now is, is so timely and so important. Next slide, please, Alice. We've made so much progress over the last decade. Um, the Clean Seas campaign raised awareness. Uh, scientists have been working to identify the magnitude and the sources of the problem. Member states and environmental groups have really begun to sound the alarm. And uh, we're seeing the private sector more and more leaning in to contribute to solutions. It's so particularly important, the enormous progress that was made as part of the ad hoc uh, expert group process um, with all of these different parts of, of uh, the community coming together to really clarify these issues, to bring forward the evidence and has this whole process has really served to galvanize further the political will. Next slide, please. And this expert group's work really looked across the entire life cycle. Um, the sources of marine and plastic litter across all of all the whole life cycle in ending up into the ocean. And I know that you have the report of the AHEG in front of you, but I just want to take some time now to highlight a few of the real, of the, to me, what are some really meaningful outcomes. Next slide. I mean, it was, uh, thank you, Alice. It was really known that, uh, you know, certainly sound waste management was an essential, essential component to addressing this issue. Um, sharing information, uh, providing access to technology, ensuring an understanding of best practices, all of this was essentially important. And I think that uh, there, were, there was a lot of understanding of this going into the process in terms of the need for partnerships to ensure building capacity across the board so that we could all move forward together on this issue. And this is something it was clear that we know that we could do. Next slide. But it was also essential to look at production and consumption. And the member states and stakeholders engaged in this process really understood the importance of a circular design with the intention of reuse, repair, and recycle. Um, and understood that there needed to be an emphasis and a real examination of what are the opportunities to reduce single-use plastic where it's not necessary, and what are the alternatives that exist so that we could really ensure that there's a a, a serious reduction in the releases that go into the waste stream. Next slide. And it was also very clear that there's a need to incentivize markets in recycling. So there's a need to build in recycling consideration in the product design, but also ensure that information is available and improve how that information is, uh, is accessed. Um, and this was including the understanding that there's still going to be a need to deal with legacy plastic across the board. So the AHEAD process looked at the whole range of the whole life cycle of uh, the sources to see, as we like to say. Next slide. It was also important that the AHEAD process considered um, all of the existing or instruments, the entire landscape. Um, where existing mandates uh, were already in place and there were efforts ongoing, 
um, and how to build on the efforts of the MEAs, like the Basel Convention, which we'll hear more about in a moment, um, the regional seas work that is so enormous and has been so important in terms of moving us forward. And so that whatever actions are taken on a global effort is in synergy with and it complements and not duplicates uh, existing efforts. Next slide, please. As Bruno said in his introductions, the AHIC agreed from its first meeting that continuing, continuing the status quo was not gonna be an option. That was understood right at the beginning. Um, the, there's a strong science-based approach that is essential to guide interventions. And that we do now have enough knowledge. We understand the root causes of the problem to start acting. And this, this is a very important aspect of this process that we're now armed with sufficient technical understanding. And we have now the opportunity to move forward with the policy discussions that are so essential to ensure that there's a real understanding of the substantive issues that have to be addressed prior to and proceeding and preparing for the AHIG 5.2. We know that it's gonna take no less than all hands on deck with innovation across government, private sector and society and global measures need to synergize with existing MEA efforts at the regional, national, local levels even. Uh, market conditions um, are essential to shift the game and we also have to we heard from the AHIG, it's so important that we are incorporating monitoring of progress to stay on track, as is looking at the technology and financial assistance that's necessary to ensure that we bring everyone together forward to achieve this goal. A global agreement should not be an excuse for making a pause or having any inaction now. It's essential that we continue efforts to continue to combat the problem. In the meantime, as a discussion of how global actions can move forward. And we know that there is no single bullet to end marine litter and plastic pollution. Upstream and downstream solutions must be deployed together. Last slide, please. Thank you so much for being here in this conversation. And my, my final message is now let's get to work. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Susan, and it's a very positive message. Let's get to work. We've got the technical knowledge we know, and, and the ad hoc ex expert group has, has done incredible uh, work uh, that is now recognized and is uh, the basis for action. Uh, Rolf, uh, you are the next speaker. The Basel Rotterdam Con uh, Stockholm Conventions have been active players in these processes, and we'd like to hear from you as well. Uh, so that we have the full context before going to our colleagues from member states. Thank you, Bruno, and thank you, Suzanne. We are indeed uh, in the middle of the action, as you probably know, with the adoption of the amendments uh, in 2019, in fact. Uh, and time has, has flowed so much, but I would just like to, to, to say that I'm very happy today to be at this high-level session and closing this very exciting series on the Geneva Bit Plastics uh, Pollution Dialogue. I would also like to join everybody in taking the opportunity to thank all the speakers that are with us today, but also our partners, the governments of Norway and uh, Switzerland, but also the Geneva Environment Network, CL, and the Global Governance, Governance Center of the Graduate Institute, as well as, of course, uh, United Nations Environment Program. We, uh, uh, as the Basel, Rotterdam and Stockholm Conventions, have together the three conventions address the life cycle of chemicals and wastes. And of course, the three conventions together play a big role in the bit, bit plastics pollution and all the other initiatives that are being launched globally to reverse the tide on the plastics pollution. Now, while the Basel Convention has been in the forefront of all the discussions uh, with, with respect to our work in the last two years, what we've seen in uh, the last uh, scientific meeting, which is the, what we call the POPRC, which is the Persistent Organic Pollutants uh, uh, Chemicals Review Committee, uh, is uh, the introduction or the proposition proposal for a chemical that is used in plastics, uh, which uh, actually 
gives uh, UV protection properties to plastics being considered under the Stockholm Convention. And, and this, of course, has, uh, has kind of shown the role of the at least two conventions for now in the, in the, in the work that we are doing to deal with the issue of plastics. And as you know, the work on within the Basel Convention has already is already in full swing. We already have the Plastic Waste Partnership in full swing, which was launched uh, exactly a year ago to the week. They already have project groups, and uh, every day uh, we have uh, 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 a private sector, governments, and also NGOs expressing the wish to join the partnership. So it's not too late to join the partnership. Uh, it's still open for, for for partners to come and join the partnership. And in fact, they've identified a number of critical areas, which have been, uh, when I looked at the outcomes of all the dialogues, are uh, reflecting what is coming out of the dialogues that we've had over the last uh, uh, few weeks and months. So in a, in a nutshell, the direct implications, as you know, the plastic waste amendments, which is shown on the on the slides, I didn't want to go and talk on the slides because I've used those slides before. And just a reminder is that the, the plastic waste amendments under the Basel Convention imply that all plastic waste and mixtures of plastic waste generated by parties to the convention will now be subject to the prior informed consent. And as you all know, this came into force on the 1st of January this year, and many governments have already moved forward to put in place different measures and policies to uh, implement this amendment. And of course, the Secretariat is working very closely with a number of governments to support them in putting in place those measures as well to implement uh, this amendment. So, so all in all, the, amend the, the, the implementation of this amendment is moving uh, smoothly, especially in the di different regions of the planet. Uh, it is uh, important for me to keep repeating this is that the amendments promote responsibility and traceability. And, uh, and as I've said before, it is, a, it is the, the responsibility for management of waste rests on the country that is generating the waste. And, and this is something that is fundamental to the convention and fundamental in the area of environmental responsibility. When countries take ownership of their own waste, then a lot of things start to happen. What happens is that then there is a strong government uh, intervention. There are, is the development of strong government policy. There is the engagement through incentives, through other frameworks of the private sector to look at how we can improve waste management, waste sorting, waste classification, and, and, and of course, importantly, uh, recycling. And as you all know as well, many governments have put in place uh, bans or restrictions on different types of plastics, such as single-use plastics and other types of uh, plastics and that has all contributed these are all government po policies that have contributed to addressing the issue of course as raised before by uh, susan the the challenge of waste management remains a big challenge and and this is a big challenge for governments and the private sector al alike but what is the good news is that there are a lot of good working examples and practices around the world there's a lot of lessons that have been learned in waste management and i think we need to grab those as well and, and share uh, uh, among the different countries. Um, I would also like to, to say that we've also launched a small grants program, which is aimed at strengthening legal institutional capacity of many developing countries. And, uh, and uh, through those programs, we've had generous donors from Norway, France, Switzerland, Sweden, Japan, Germany, and the European Union, and as well as the private sector. And altogether, we've been able to mobilize around 10 million US dollars over the last two years towards those actions. And, uh, and I think it's important uh, to, to make mention of the chemical that I, that I mentioned before, which is now being considered under the Stockholm Convention, which has actually been detected in uh, remote areas of our planet. And in fact, when looking at the little pamphlet uh, generated by Jen, there is a nice uh, graphic there of a global map showing atmospheric measurements of plastics in the in the atmosphere uh, of a paper published uh, in this uh, in 2020. This shows us, you know, to what extent us as humans have impacted on our planet in terms of plastic pollution, where it is now not only found in the oceans but also 
in the air. And when it reaches the air, then it can be transported much faster around the world and uh, it be picked up by organisms and even humans in remote parts of the planet. I, uh, I would just say that we, we are now looking ahead to the BRS Corps. As many of you have heard, the Bureau has agreed to to have the Corps in two segments, an online, a short online segment from the 26th to 30th of July 2021, and then a, a longer, the normal two weeks face-to-face -face segment in 2022, which will hope, which in my view will, uh, I hope will also lead to further uh, decisions and further actions on plastics. There's a number of expert working groups at work within the convention, such as the plastic uh, waste working group. And there's also a number of initiatives which uh, governments will be putting forward for consideration by the COPS in 2022. So with those few words, I would just like to thank you all and uh, be ready to answer any questions. And thank you so much. And over to you, Bruno. Thanks a lot, Rolf. And, uh... With this intervention and Susan's intervention, we've indeed uh, set the, the, the seed of the general context of the plastic issue and governance. Now, as I said, we have had a number of uh, dialogues in Geneva, uh, and this was supported notably by uh, Norway and Switzerland. So I would like now to pass the floor to, his, to Her Excellency Ambassador Tinmark Smith of Norway. Uh, uh, the floor is your ambassador. Thank you so much and good afternoon, colleagues and friends. It's good to see you all. Let me first congratulate the Geneva Environment Network, UNEP and partners on a very successful initiative, reaching a truly global audience beyond the Geneva community with this timely series of events that we have seen. Norway has been an active supporter of the series, drawing upon the core competencies of the UN Geneva family. So let me thank all the partners and the speakers that have joined this dialogue over the past months, sharing their knowledge and their insights. The Geneva Beat Plastic Pollution Dialogues clearly show the global attention and willingness to address the issue of plastic pollution and its intersection with relevant actors and UN agencies here in Geneva, ranging from health and human rights to standards and trade. As the way we do business has been drastically changed due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, this series has brought us further in our discussions to find solutions to one of the fastest growing environmental crises of over time. We need to share our knowledge, bring out the latest updates from the scientific community and explore solutions together and then assess how to effectively deal with these issues on a global level because there is no vaccine against plastic solution, plastic pollution. The ad hoc open-ended expert group established by UNIA and from which we will, sh we will hear more about later, completed their work last November and clearly underlined the urgency to act on this issue. Last month, during the first part of UNIA 5, you heard many voices speaking out in favor of a new global agreement. We welcome the announcement of UNIA 5 by Germany, Ecuador and Ghana, supported by UNEP, to host the first ever ministerial conference on marine plastic litter and plastic pollution this year. This shows that despite the trial restrictions we're facing, there is a willingness to make progress to tackle the environmental consequences of plastic pollution. Plastic is a great material that provides important functions in our modern day societies. Yet these properties are the same that cause detriment to the environment and ecosystems when plastic waste is mismanaged. The plastic pollution problem is largely due to the lack of good governance and under regulation of plastics across the whole life cycle. An important step forward to better regulate one aspect, namely the transboundary movement of plastic waste, was taken by the Basic Convention of the Parties in May 2019 that we just heard about. Over the last few years, the global discussion on plastic pollution has evolved rapidly. As demonstrated by this series and other events, a multitude of actors are driving forward science-based discussions on sources, pathways and effects. This is crucial to inform our policy response and to get in place effective measures. Strengthening the global response to plastic pollution is a key priority for my government. It is our ambition 
to start negotiations on a global agreement to prevent plastic pollution at the UN Environment Assembly in 2022 by establishing an intergovernmental negotiating committee. We believe a new agreement is necessary to provide a framework for cooperation and maintain a long-term commitment. Such a structure should first support governments in their national policies, policies as well as strengthening work in the regions. Second, support scientific development and technical advances. And third, enable the international community to monitor progress to prevent plastic pollution. I clearly see a place for the Geneva Environment Network Beat Plastic Pollution Dialogues to continue to provide a meeting place for sharing knowledge, bringing out the issues and exploring important questions in support of discussions. A new global agreement will not exist in a vacuum. As we progress in our preparations for the second part of UNIA 5 in Nairobi, February 2022, we will need all hands on deck. And if I may repeat, because there is no vaccine against plastic pollution. I welcome your support and engagement. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Ambassador. All hands on deck. I think that's really a clear message that is passed uh, today. Uh, uh, um, we, as I mentioned, the dialogue is also uh, supported by Switzerland, a host country and a strong supporter of the GEN. And I've got the pleasure now to turn to uh, Felix Wertli of the Federal Office of Environment of Switzerland. Felix. Thank you very much, Bruno. And uh, good afternoon, Excellencies, colleagues. I would like first also to congratulate to GEN and UNEP to organize such a substantive series of events and the large audience we were able to reach. I would also like to thank all the actors from International Geneva that have participated in these dialogues. We have seen that Geneva-based expertise plays an important role in addressing the plastic crisis. For example, through institutions and experts in the health and chemicals and waste cluster here in Geneva, but also academia and civil society. Looking back at the discussions and dialogues and the broader context, I would like to outline a few points of our analysis, where we are coming from, where we stand, and where we could go. So looking back, where we are coming from. We have gone a long way. The topic is not considered a new or emerging issues, but is now a global plastic crisis. Already in 2014, at UNIA 1, Member states recognized the global environmental threat of marine plastic pollution. Over the course of the last six, seven years, since 2014, we negotiated and decided at UNEAS, at different UNEAS, on 13 pages of decision text on this issue. We have been working at expert level and as well intergovernmentally. We have increased our knowledge on governance and on technical research related issues. For example, UNEP support of the advisory group has developed two comprehensive reports. We have as well as governments task ourselves to report on national, regional and global barriers and respect respective response options. Effectiveness of activities. So where do we stand after all this work that has been done? While initiatives and processes are in place, we see that they cannot provide a coherent, coordinated, efficient, and effective response to this global environmental concern. Observations show the level of activities is not sufficient. In addition to the limitation by the geographical focus of existing processes, there's also a restriction with respect to what they are tackling along the life cycle of plastics. For the most part, initiatives and processes tackle one single element in the life cycle. For example, clean up, cleaning up of beaches or the waste management. More upstream measures have not been addressed yet. Overall, with the existing measures, processes and initiatives in place, we cannot address the threat as of global nature. We cannot address the full life cycle of plastics or the gaps in measures that exist. Looking at this situation, what do we think is needed? Our Minister, Her Excellency, Mr. Norris Minister, Minister Samaruga, raised this issue at UNEA 5.1. And she stated that it's high time 
to launch negotiations for a plastic convention. As we know, UNEA has the mandate to provide overarching policy guidance and is able to launch negotiations for a legally binding agreement, the so-called ink process. We're looking forward to discuss at UNEA 5.2 the possibility to launch such negotiations as well as possible key elements of such a new framework. A lot of the ideas and uh, ideas around measures and possible conventions has been discussed during these dialogues and more conversations will be needed. However, certain ideas that came up and we consider important are the following. A new framework would have to talk to strategic goals, implementation, supporting measures, monitoring and compliance. It would have to consider a life cycle approach and include land-based sources. This would encompass the concept of circle economy or knowledge and measures on production and design, including on environmentally sound alternatives. It has to address questions on how to reduce consumption, increase reuse and recycling, or how to deal with chemical additives and microplastics and how to enhance the waste management. Regarding the structure, such a framework could consist of legally binding, but also voluntary components. A structure that we also know well from the Basel Convention, Rolf has outlined before certain elements of the plastic uh, waste partnerships that are um, multi-stakeholders, include private sector, and are additional to legally binding um, components. And last but not least, we have to consider and discuss further how such a framework could cooperate and collaborate with existing measures to avoid duplication, but harness synergies. So thank you again for the opportunity to provide some inputs and we're looking forward to the further discussions this afternoon. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Felix. And uh, so with this, we have a good summary as well uh, uh, through these two interventions of what was discussed in the Geneva Big Plastic Dialogues and 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 the words uh, uh, that have come forward are indeed that we have now uh, the technical knowledge we know and the time is for action. So what are the next steps between uh, now that UNEA 5.1 is behind us and, and the next uh, UNEA, uh, what can we do all together? Uh, the follow-up of the AHEC is, is, is important to put in perspective and for this uh, I would like to uh, invite uh, Excell uh, sorry, Her Excellency Ambassador Silvia Elena Alfaro Espinosa of Peru uh, to first uh, take the floor uh, and uh, we should have had with us um, uh, Director General Juliet Cabrera of Rwanda to give us another perspective. Sadly, uh, uh, Director General could not uh, join us uh, in that is a last minute uh, 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 change in a schedule. And so I will try after uh, uh, Peru's intervention to summarize quickly what uh, uh, Rwanda wanted to bring forward. So um, Ambassador, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Do, do you hear me? Do you Can you listen to me? We hear you very well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, first of all, thank you, Bruno, uh, for the moderation of, of, of this very important meeting. And I thank very much uh, the Geneva Environment Network for organizing this high-level dialogue on plastics governance, following the Geneva Beat Plastic Pollution Dialogues, uh, which have comprehensively addressed the issue of plastic pollution as a major environmental concern. It is an honor for me to, to be uh, within all these very important uh, personalities uh, to share this afternoon of so much uh, importance to the world. Peru is a very vulnerable country to the problem of plastic pollution due to our location with more than 3,000 kilometers of coastal extension facing the Pacific Ocean. In our ocean, we have more than 1,000 fish species, more than 1,000 types of mollusks and crustaceans, more than 200 of 
echinoderms, 32 different marine cetaceans, and five species of sea turtles out of the seven worldwide. Peru's connection with the ocean and its sustainable use and conservation is ancient. The fishing activities in the Peruvian Sea started as early as 5,000 years ago, when the people of Carao, the oldest city in the Americas, practiced fish and mollusk catching using cotton fishing nets, hooks, and boats. At present, Peru is the first world producer of fish meal made of Peruvian anchovy, a fish rich in nutrients that is exported worldwide. However, plastics harm the wildlife, fisheries, tourism, recreation activities, and threaten marine ecosystems. Peru generates approximately 20,000 tons of solid waste at the level of local governments, and plastics represent around 10% of the solid waste generated being the vast majority single-use plastics. On average, 30 kilos of plastic a year are used per citizen, and 3 billion plastic bags are generated per year. Only in Lima, our capital, generates 886 tons of plastic waste per day, representing 46% of the national plastic waste. These figures may have to be reassessed in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. The impact of the COVID-19 goes beyond the health sector and has, especially in developing countries, profound socioeconomic consequences, hindering the achievement of the SDGs. In addition to that, we also have to look at ways to manage adequately the solid waste produced by personal protection equipment, such as masks, plastic shields, shirings, as well as the very much likely increase in the use of plastic bags and disposable containers needed for the food delivery that are being used more often due to the confinement measures. Taking the above into account, in recent years, we have advanced at the national level in managing solid waste, as well as reducing the use of plastics. Let me mention a few examples. The law of integral management of solid waste. The National Plan on Competitiveness and Productivity 2019-2030, which includes the transit to a circular and eco-efficient economy as a priority. The signature of the Global Agreement of the New Plastics Economy promoted by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. The approval of the Single-Use Plastic and Disposable Containers Law, which generates incentives to reduce the use of plastics since consumers now have to pay for their plastics bags and disposable containers. And the approval of a roadmap towards a circular economy, including the plastic industry. In addition, we have implemented several information campaigns to raise awareness on plastic pollution among the citizens, such as the Clean Peru campaign, the Save the Beach campaign, and I don't want this on my ceviche campaign, just to mention a few. Finally, we promote and implement cleaner production agreements with the private sector related to plastic production with voluntary commitments to improve the efficiency of materials and to reduce the amount of waste generated. However, since we face a transboundary problem, the actions at the national level have to be complemented with a coordinated global solution involving involving governments, as well as civil society, academia, the private sector, and the consumers. The above has been recognized by the UNIA in several resolutions since its first meeting. Peru had the opportunity to participate in the ad hoc expert working group, AHEG, 
on marine litter and microplastics from 2018 to 2020. And we are glad that the AHEG was able to fulfill its mandate and provide concrete options to tackle the plastic problem at the global level and that numerous participants supported the option of a new global agreement on plastics. In doing so, we believe that the following shall be taken into account. The measures shall apply in all stages of the life cycle of plastics. The solution shall be integral and involve the different actors in the life cycle of plastics, ranging from producers and marketeers to consumers and recyclers, as well as the public sector, including local governments. A circular economy approach shall be promoted. A global solution may consider standards to allow governments to determine the sustainability of materials and pr products within the global supply chains. A mitigation approach is also required to promote the sound management of plastic waste. Marine and terrestrial sources of pollution have to be considered. A sensitization component is also required, including the promotion of sustainable consumption of plastic products, as well as possible control measures on certain materials. The response should be aligned with the 2030 agenda and take into account a just transition that considers the social implications for employment, innovation and sustainable development as a whole. Any response should also take into account the science policy interface international cooperation, including technical and financial assistance to developing countries, the different realities and capabilities among countries, and a multi-stakeholders engagement. On the way forward, Peru will continue to engage constructively, and together with Rwanda and the active support of others, we have started working to achieve concrete results on this particular important issue in the second part of the UNEA 5 in February 2022. Towards that goal, we believe that events like this are pivotal in generating the consensus needed to move forward among all stakeholders on the need to address plastic pollution in the perspective of long-term goals and the establishment of new governance structures, such as a new legal agreement that we believe are not contradictory, but rather complementary to the current actions being undertaken within the existing frameworks at the national, regional, and global level. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Ambassador, uh, for uh, explaining Peru's perspective and definitely also sharing once again this very powerful campaign. We don't want this on Aceviche, definitely <laughs> not. Uh, uh, but it is uh, an impressive uh, set of action. And as you also reminded us, COVID has added an extra layer of uh, on the urgency for action on the matter. As I was uh, uh, in the introduction saying, uh, uh, Director General Cabrera of Rwanda could not join us, but uh, if I take a little bit of time, just two minutes to summarize what she wanted to tell us, uh, 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 DG was reminding us of the extraordinary steps taken already 15 years ago uh, by Rwanda to uh, uh, take the initiative of banning plastic bags and specific types of packaging, and at that time it was a revolutionary uh, ID that uh, has been now taken uh, by many other countries. Uh, but Rwanda also uh, went, went further and in September 2019 has adopted a law uh, that prohibits the manufacturing, import and use and sale of plastic bags and single-use plastic items. And uh, 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 by doing so, it has also put in place a system to accompany uh, the private sector federations and uh, uh, and uh, 
the Cleaner Production and Climate Innovation Center of Rwanda is now supporting business in transition to alternatives because this is also very important to provide and to include the private sector in this in this work. Uh, Rwanda has been a very active member of the international community and uh, is looking at the result of the ad hoc uh, open and expert group on marionita and microplastic as an important uh, step uh, uh, to lead us towards uh, uh, the future. Uh, uh, the uh, Rwanda also insists on the inherent transboundary nature of plastic pollution and the need to tackle it at its sources, uh, making a strong point that a more circular economy is needed if we are to have any chance of building a sustainable and regenerative global economy in the coming decades. Therefore, uh, with this, uh, Rwanda wants to thank all nations uh, that are uh, on board uh, uh, on tackling the plastic crisis and uh, support of the re resolution proposed by Rwanda and Peru, uh, also thanking uh, the UN Environment Programme uh, for uh, the scientific and legal advisory bodies, the Environment Management Group and of course the AEC uh, for the work that has been done and uh, uh, the last uh, point that uh, uh, DG was wanting to share with us was to encourage all nations to take immediate steps to limit the manufacture and use of single-use plastics and address together plastic pollution. As we prepare a strong international agreement that has been set a number of times through an intergovernmental negotiating committee, there is much that we can do all together but also in our own countries. So with this, uh, and this full message, the full message of DG will be also put online by uh, the Geneva Environment Network, but uh, uh, so we could share uh, the message that Wanda wanted to give us. Now, let me turn uh, to uh, the European Union and especially its presidency, Portugal, uh, and I've got the pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Nuna uh, Lacasta with us. Uh, Nuna, uh, the floor is yours. No, no, sorry, no, no, the floor is yours, well, excuse me. <laughs> thanks very much uh, for the invitation. It's obviously uh, a pleasure to participate on behalf of Portugal's rotating EU presidency. Let, let me just start, if I may, however, with a personal comment, twofold personal comment, because way back when, in the late 90s, I, I worked for CL, for the Center for International Environmental Office, in the Geneva office. So I feel like I am in that room we, we, we saw her earlier, and I definitely miss Geneva. It was a great time, as I said, in the late 90s. Um, but of course, I, I, uh, the European Union uh, um, welcomes this, this, this roast of initiatives, uh, which uh, uh, the Geneva Environment Network and UNEP are, are spearheading. I think these are very important. I think it's very important, of course, that we're seeing, perhaps, somebody working on environmental policy for quite a while, this strange phenomenon whereby several stakeholders are uh, perhaps in a generation, for the first time in a generation, pushing governments towards action, clearly on climate policy and uh, also on, on plastics and marine litter. And I think that's very important and, and, and albeit strange, but it's, it's a challenge we need to, we need to take, to take on, on, on board. And, and I think we are uh, increasingly, um, because this is, a, after all, a cross-cutting topic one which requires governments coordinated action, uh, companies innovative impulses, and of course, public engagement. Many of us, actually, when we could go out for the pandemic, would spend weekend, uh, several weekends in, in going to campaigns to, to beaches, those that have them, uh, uh, getting out marine litter. And, uh, and in Portugal, my home country, we, we are indeed a, a, an oceans nation. Um, uh, in Europe, uh, the European Green Deal is the new economic, the new economic, I emphasize this word, growth strategy for the EU. But it's also now the bedrock of the COVID recovery and resilience support programs in the European Union. The European Green Deal is geared towards a 2030 uh, uh, timeframe by an unprecedented aligning of different union policies, agriculture, um, uh, financing, industrial, environment, uh, yeah, health, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's also fostering such an alignment at country level uh, 
through in particular EU financing and regulatory instruments. I think this is quite interesting again because it is uh, an unprecedented policy push towards disalignment in terms of uh, resource use and natural resource use, particularly, and public policies and indeed economic changes. Uh, it is, of course, the union's. Uh, it is it is intended that the union's uh, climate and environmental challenges will become uh, a, a, a unique opportunity to building an equitable, equitable, competitive and prosperous society, which of course, in by, by 2050, which is around the corner really, uh, will be a carbon neutral society in which economic growth is decoupled from economic, from resources use. Um, so an important set of initiatives is already in place. Uh, and I'll uh, mention the, the most relevant. Uh, already in 2019, single use plastics legislation was adopted, geared also towards reducing marine litter. I think it shocked everybody, policymakers and, and, and the public, that the three main causes of marine, lit marine litter, uh, of course, include plastics, cigarette butts, was something which was very vivid, and as, as the Peruvian ambassador just showed us, and other colleagues, we're now seeing also uh, uh, face masks showing in, in, in huge numbers uh, in, in our in our shores, in our ocean. Um, uh, in 2020, we were very busy indeed at the EU level, but by the investment plan for European Green Deal and the mechanism for just transition, which were approved, the European industrial strategy, the circular economy action plan, the second version of it, and the European climate pact. And in 2021, just a few weeks ago, we've adopted at the EU level uh, commission communication proposal on a new climate adaptation strategy. When it comes to the circular economy action plan, um, it includes a lot of initiatives uh, to accelerate the transition to a new economic model when moving away from extract, use and throw away to reuse, recycle and revalue goods and services. In short, of course, circularity. Uh, of course, sustainable resource use, particularly on raw materials, is crucial for reducing greenhouse gas emissions and for halting and reversing the loss of, of biodiversity. This is a systemic approach, particularly important to dealing with plastics use by considering the impacts of plastics through, throughout extraction, manufacturing, use and disposal. And in Europe, we have a several uh, initiatives, uh, particularly focused on plastics, again, under the banner of European Sustainable Product Policy, which look at different value chains, and some of these initiatives include reinforcing the essential requirements for packaging and reducing over packaging and packaging waste, setting mandatory requirements on recycled plastic content and plastic waste reduction measures for key products, such as packaging, construction materials and vehicles, restricting intentionally added microplastics and putting forward measures on unintentional release of microplastics, a policy framework for bio-based plastics and biodegradable and compostable plastics. This is important also to, to work towards and with the plumbers uh, uh, industry, as we know, and replacing single-use packaging, tableware and cutlery by reusable products in food services. And so what we're seeing across the member states, again, is something which uh, we've just heard from Peru, which is, which are a, a whole new generation of agreements between stakeholders, industry, authorities uh, 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 towards indeed having strict deadlines on reducing and or eliminating single-use plastic across value chains. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, just a, a few, a couple of quick words on, on, on the international dimension of this uh, challenge. So it's very heartening indeed to see that the international community, that the multilateral uh, environmental community is indeed re-engaged uh, in, in, in a topic of, of such an important uh, uh, consequence. And for the EU, uh, the EU is indeed sought to be an international reference in terms of environmental standards and has led, for instance, climate policy, actually for decades now. We're equally committed to leading on circular economy and plastics management. Um, we have 
uh, included in, on our action plans initiatives at the global and multilateral levels. I would even go uh, so far as saying that in all union environmental objectives and targets go beyond the European Union's borders, either through neighborhood policy or more broadly through multilateral uh, initiatives. And so to support the global shift to a new paradigm, the EU is namely committed to reaching a global agreement on plastics, ensuring a free trade agreement that, if, that free trade agreements reflect the enhanced objectives of the circular economy. It is, it is a tough task. We all know that, but we believe there is no alternative to also working uh, multilaterally. And so, of course, the Global Alliance for on Circular Economy and Resource Efficiency recently launched is uh, one of the deliverables of the EU circular economy's international dimension. Uh, and so, just to conclude. I would say that um, when it comes to, to changing, when it comes to changing consumption and production patterns, we are faced with great ambition, and but equally multiple challenges. And in our view, uh, it is very important to have the involvement of, of all actors in the dynamics of transformation uh, of, our, of our societies and our economies. So the EU remains committed to, to this approach going forward. So thanks very much for this opportunity to address you all. Thanks a lot, Nuno, for uh, uh, giving us uh, uh, the the message from the uh, from Portugal, but also from the European Union, indeed. And and as you said, uh, there's ambition, and that's what we need to. That's what also brings us all around this table, I think. And when I say all, that's also including uh, uh, partners outside of government. And I would like now to welcome uh, uh, Marco Lambertini, uh, Director General of uh, WWF, uh, uh, who is a, a regular customer of the GEN as well. Marco, if I may say, uh, uh, could we have your perspective on, on uh, the situation and notably on, on this global agreement that we are discussing? Bruno, thank you very much. And uh, thank you so much for inviting me to participate. Um, let me start um, with, uh, with the uh, obvious uh, uh, point, but uh, still an important obvious point, uh, which is the, the, the fact that the ocean is, is truly in crisis. I think science has never been clearer about the unprecedented pressures, unprecedented in terms of their nature, in terms of scale, in terms of the acceleration over, over the years. Uh, pollution, overfishing, acidification, rising uh, water temperatures, deoxygenation, dead zones, uh, the threat, the new threat of deep sea mining, and the list could go on. Two-thirds of the ocean has been uh, altered somehow by human activities, and 90% of the fish stocks, commercial fish stocks, are either fully fished or overfished. And I can go on, but I don't need to. But this is just because I think in all the discussion we are having, on the ocean and frankly on the planet um, uh, health uh, we need to uh, remember this and 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 that there is no room for complacency there is, the situation is extremely serious and so we need solutions at scale and urgently the second uh, reflection um, it's about the narrative the narrative has really evolved uh, quite dramatically um, around uh, uh, ocean health ocean crisis uh, is now perceived no more as just an ecological issue, but actually is an economic and humanitarian uh, uh, issue. And, um, and this is connected to the discussion on the blue economy, the blue economy um, that uh, in many ways, we talk about a, a, a new dimension of our economy. In fact, the blue economy has been with us since the beginning of our civilization and is here and now super strong. Um, we calculated a marine gross product, a kind of GDP uh, equivalent for the ocean. Uh, in terms of goods and services, so that would account at least to 2.5 trillion US dollars uh, uh, per year, uh, which will make it the seventh uh, uh, largest global economy in, in the world. So the focus should be on how we can actually make the blue economy of today uh, and of the future uh, a sustainable one. And plastic is part of the challenge. Plastic pollution, ocean plastic is part of the challenge. The impact of plastic in the ocean is growing. Uh, many dimensions are still not fully 
known, so potentially the impact is even greater than we understand today, including one on human health. So the issue is super serious. And back to my first point, you know, one other figure. Uh, in the last 50 years, 80%, uh, uh, we've seen an 80% decline of fish stocks. And in the same period, a 100% increase in ocean plastic. So another call for urgency. But uh, uh, coming to the ocean plastic uh, issue and what we just discussed, um, um, there is no silver bullet to resolving the issue of plastic pollution. It's, it's, it's a complex value chain. Uh, and, uh, and so we need, we need a no holistic approach. Holistic approach that really needs to revolve around a number of key streams, uh, all in different ways, extremely important and interconnected. Uh, and for that, we need a clear set, uh, a clear direction uh, of travel uh, uh, as a global community, but also a clear set of targets, time-bound targets. Targets on reduction, targets on uh, waste management, targets on uh, circularity, targets on low footprint alternatives, um, and of course, targets on how to direct financial flows towards supporting these transitions. And, uh, and therefore, we really strongly feel that we need a plan, as others already have, uh, have mentioned, a plan uh, that is uh, bringing together uh, all the great efforts that have been already uh, uh, undertaken until, until now um, by many governments, many businesses, but align all that to the right level of ambition and create a level, level playing field that brings together all players, all governments, businesses, and of course, consumers as well. So we are very excited to see uh, an increased uh, um, uh, recognition and, and support for the need of a global plastic uh, pollution treaty. Uh, we can see from many government and businesses convergence on how this should look like and also convergence that the UNEA platform could be the one that takes the lead in, in, in shaping uh, the targets uh, uh, and, and, and beginning to develop the plan through a, an intergovernmental um, um, a negotiating body. That's really urgent now. And, and I think, uh, you know, we, we can celebrate a lot of successes, a lot of action commitment. We heard many of those today. But frankly, until we have a clear direction of travel, a clear global goal, and a clear set of targets that everybody agrees universally, uh, uh, we are going to continue to struggle to uh, tackle this issue at the right level of ambition. That's uh, what we feel, and uh, and we feel the time is mature to start now, not waiting uh, far too long. And the global ministerial conference that uh, the government in Ecuador, Ghana, Germany, and I know with the support of many others, it's happening uh, in a few months' time. That could be a great checkpoint, a great opportunity for us to be ready in time for UNEA 5.2, and also to begin to send a signal to the markets and, and for businesses to really get ready to embrace common direction, but particularly to support uh, the development of the global treaty. So this is uh, uh, exciting, uh, but uh, it's all uh, uh, related to uh, how we can actually speed up this process. It was quite shocking <laughs> to hear before, earlier on that the first discussion at the UNEA, and I remember that actually, was in 2011. My goodness, it's 2020. So we really have to accelerate, and, uh, and I think the time is ready. The public demands that. Many governments and businesses are ready to embrace it. And so, um, uh, WBF stands firm to support uh, this effort as well from our part. Thanks, Bruno, and everyone. Thank you for having me. Thanks a lot, Marco. And uh, with this, we've been uh, through uh, uh, the panel. And before we go into a small session of question and answer, and I'll ask Malu to who has been uh, of the Geneva Environment Network. Malu has been checking the Q and the Q&A uh, while we were discussing. Uh, before we go into this, I, I, I'm going to try to maybe uh, say one of two words of, 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 of what binds everything together. And by binds, I don't mention the binding agreement, but really what brings us all together. It's, it's really A, we won't accept the status quo. And it's really clear and it's really uh, important that we mention that time and time again that uh, it is it is now time for action secondly the respect that we all have for the work the technical work that has been done by the ad hoc expert group and that uh, sets the scene now for further action for a basically a political decision and a global uh, agreement and and really uh, uh, we hope 
that uh, by having these uh, meetings here in, in, in Geneva and virtually, we've contributed to uh, this call for action and for this call uh, to uh, very quickly bring us all together into an international global uh, agreement uh, uh, that, that will uh, uh, tackle this issue because the science is clear and the technical knowledge is clear and so we just have to uh, be bold enough uh, to, uh, to to make it happen uh, along all the life cycle of plastic. Uh, I hope you agree with my conclusion. If you, if you don't, if you want to add, please just uh, uh, raise your hand. But otherwise, we will uh, go uh, to uh, Malu and see if there are some questions that can that you can address. Yes, hi. Good afternoon to everybody. So we have a question uh, regarding the international economic cooperation, indicating that a recent UNCTAD study shows that international trade in plastics is worth at least one trillion annually. How can we ensure a new treaty addresses the need for international economic cooperation, which includes trade, to tackle plastic pollution and decarbonize the sector? And then we have received uh, several comments from Facebook and on WebEx congratulating the panel for their work with a special mention to Peru for the use of catchy phrases on the plastic awareness campaigns. That's it for the moment. Thank you. About, about uh, trade and plastic, but uh, Rolf, would, are you comfortable if I turning to you oh, uh, I was <laughs> I had a topic <laughs> discussion for everybody what comes to mind right now is very clear is that plastics is a resource it's not a waste once we're finishing using that plastic it is clear that uh, you know the plastic can be either recycled into the original for this original purpose or into another purpose and and we've seen many examples and many companies going to that direction so which which means that, you know, the value of, uh, okay, I'm just uh, um, estimating here and, and making some, uh, some quick calculations. Well, not quick, but back of the notebook uh, kind of assumption is the amount of plastics that is now amount of petroleum or whatever that we are now using to make plastics. A high, very high proportion of this can be, can be recycled. And of course, now many companies are also very sensitive to special plastics, as I mentioned before, Stockholm is now looking at very special plastics that uh, have additives in them that protect against UV. And, and of course, these are very important properties because a lot of the external products that are used have got this UV chemical in them. But when we phase out this chemical, there'll be new alternatives and there'll be new, new products coming to the market. So what I'm expecting is when we design those new products, we, we design those new polymers and structures that the whole aspect of circularity is already embedded in there, which means that such companies will now be able to recycle also those that are complex. And even in some recycling, and, 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 and that's why I mentioned in my uh, intervention that, uh, you know, we, we need to, to ensure that technology is available to countries and, and, and affordable as well, especially as we push towards uh, investments in recycling, because investment in recycling is one thing, but keeping the recycling industry operating is another thing. And there's a lot of complexities because right now we are mixing all the plastics together. And while there is technology that can separate different types of plastics, those with additives, those without additives, those, you know, that is just PET, but these technologies are not yet available around the world. And I think these have existed everywhere elsewhere. So if you really want to also uh, enable countries to assume the national responsibility for recycling, uh, especially of plastics, then we need also to focus on, on having such technologies available uh, for, for those recycling companies to be able to adopt them and use them, uh, you know, and, 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 uh, ha and see uh, you know, uh, used plastics in, in new products. Yes, thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Rolf. Uh, I think very, very comprehensive answer on your side. I don't know, I don't know if someone else wants to add on this. 
I see Ambassador of Peru. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Bruno. Uh, yes, um, I, I think it's it's very important to see the multidimensional uh, aspect of, of anything that happens in the world. And, and that it has to do with, uh, with what uh, United Nations uh, uh, in general terms is trying to do uh, lately when trying to gather all the organizations to work together when, when, when working on any issue. Uh, that is why uh, it is so important when, when this, when this um, um, question asks how to bring trade to, 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 the, the, to the aspect of, of plastic uh, is, the, is, is the same thing as asking how to bring production, how to bring consumption, has, how to bring uh, the waste. I mean, uh, if, you, if we look at the, at, at the uh, little um, um, drawing that uh, Susan brought us in, in, her, in her presentation on the whole cycle of plastic, we have to bring all these offices uh, in, in, in the general arena to talk together with us, with the governments, and also, of course, with the civil society and with the consumers. Because if, if we don't have all the actors talking about the subjects, we are not going to bring the, the consciousness of, of, the, of the need of taking uh, action, uh, really. Trade, uh, of course, has to do with this, um, and um, and it has been touched somehow in WTO. The problem, I mean, the subject of plastic, but of course, it's a, it's a pro product. It's not a problem of pollution. So everything has to be taken into account, but in a multidimensional aspect. On the other hand, thank you very much for 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 the mention on, on, on Peru's uh, approach to, to the, the campaigns. Unfortunately, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, these campaigns are somehow restrained right now. Uh, this, they, the, the campaigns uh, should uh, start again once we, we have a, um, more um, openness to the public, uh, uh, openness and confinement is, 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 is stopped really. But the thing is to educate more our people. And in this regard, I wanted to mention something I think it's very, very important. The, pay, the, the role that youth has to do with all this consciousness around pollution. Uh, we have to um, get the energy of the youth, of the young people, all these activists that are around the world around environment consciousness, the youth are very important for us to continue the education in all the levels in our governments in a new world. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Ambassador, and, and thanks for reaffirming uh, the need for the holistic approach, international cooperation when we when we deal with this. And indeed, that's also why we have this conversation in International Geneva to beat the drums uh, also uh, uh, towards other UN agencies and other UN institutions that indeed are looking at, uh, at, at uh, environmental guidance on the discussions. I saw that Nuno also wanted to comment. So Nuno, over to you. Well, if, if I may, just very, three very quick comments uh, on what we heard and also a question posted on by your residents. Uh, very quickly, the first one is, is the following. The first comment is the following. I think at this point, we're in a little bit of a, of a flux because um, several of these campaigns against plastics, because of the pandemic, somehow the citizenry has sort of uh, um, stopped or at least paused for a little while. So we need to be mindful of that. For instance, in, 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 in this country, uh, government and different stakeholders are now pushing uh, for a little while, in fact, very strongly towards reusable masks. And this, this is something which which we need to be mindful of. Otherwise, we may we may actually go back rather than uh, moving forward. Secondly, uh, everybody's talked about a comprehensive strategy and an engagement of different stakeholders. In this, I would also add that, for instance, 
you know, uh, combating plastics, circular economy should go, needs to go hand in hand with decarbonization policies because we need to address the petrochemicals industry and the polymers industry, as mentioned earlier. We need to engage in terms of alternative solutions to that very important industry indeed uh, going forward. And there are options out there, but also these industries, and certainly that's the case in Europe, um, are now in a very fast process of renovating, reformulating industrial processes, which are essentially chemicals process, chemical processes, so as to be on board decarbonization policies. So that's one. And uh, uh, so that's second. And third on bio resin, just to say that we're also seeing an emergency, of course, an emergence of bioeconomy strategies. And I think that's very important. It has a very interesting potential going forward. Um, certainly in the uh, forestry and pulp and paper industry is sort of spearheading that discussion, but I see that uh, emerging across different different sectors. Thanks very much. Sorry, thanks, thanks, Nuno. Uh, I, I'm I'm conscious of the time as well, but I think we, if, if you agree, uh, colleagues, we'll take maybe one more questions. I have seen in the chat a number of very interesting questions, but I'm tempted, Malu, to uh, a look at the one that uh, 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 puts the emphasis on uh, uh, all the plastics uh, in, as alternative to single-use plastic. Can you can you go to this one? It's a very yes. complex one, though. <laughs> exactly. So there was a question regarding the relevance of plastic products that actually have longer durability to use them as an alternative to single-use plastics. And we have another question regarding the role of the WTO on what it can contribute to the joint efforts to beat plastic pollution. So, um, 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 it's my role is very easy. I'm turning to the panelists to see if there's any volunteer wanting to, to take this. Uh, uh, we, we know single used plastic uh, and we've heard a number of, of panelists saying this is this is not something to continue some countries have banned them uh, uh, what about other type of plastics uh, uh, Rolf you mentioned it's a resource we need to recycle we need to reuse but we need to be equipped for this as well I don't know if you want to complement on this or maybe if I, I I can't see if I can't see hand raised but <laughs> okay, well, I will break the ice again. I mean, definitely we need to have. No, I can. If there's no volunteer, I can chip in and re okay. rescue. <laughs> yes, there are a lot of interventions that can be done, and I okay. see that the uh, Marco will join me. Thanks, you, Marco. Uh, you know, plastics is some uh, single-use plastic was something very visible, and we could directly connect it to the consumer. So I think in terms of really reaching the homes, reaching the community, the mining of plastics, I think, was very important. And obviously, also quite a large proportion of the plastics being observed in the marine environment was also from single use. Now, another big area which I am personally looking at, uh, you know, I live in Europe, I live here in France and in Switzerland, is packaging. And we need to work with those supermarkets. We need to make progress. I know there are health issues, I know there are food safety issues, but we need to make progress in terms of packaging. I know the rest of the world also, we, we deal with a lot of packaging. These also can be recycled. I mean, we don't need to phase them up, but we need to have, we need to have systems in place that deal with food packaging. And I see it every week when I send my kids uh, with the recycling bins to the recy you know, for recycling, the amount that we accumulate. Uh, and efforts in trying to reduce uh, packaging is is really becoming hard. I, I will let Marco take over the rest of the <laughs> conversation. Marco, over to you. Marco, if, thanks, Rodolf. It's really important indeed to underline the, the issue of the packaging. I don't, Marco, do you, are, you, are you with us? Seems we have a small issue to connect with Marco. Uh, while we think sick, trying to fix this, maybe I could turn to Felix, who I, whom I think raised his hand as well. Thank you very much, Bruno. And I also have a question then to Marco, so it's perhaps not bad if I come first, if that's okay. 
just on the first question related to trade also, I think also what is hint there is the tremendous economic volume of plastic. So it's a huge industry and we use it all in our daily lives. And I think the ambassador of Peru has outlined some key concept how to deal with it also in, in a larger context. So she emphasized the holistic approach, no? And she also mentioned that we have to do it on a life cycle approach and land-based sources so tackle that all steps of the whole process. I think also we have to further work that people fully understand the costs of the plastic pollution. So to show what are the costs of non-action, what are costs that come up now in the future, just an example, let's think about the impact on fishery. If there's more pollution, there's more plastic in the sea, there's more uh, the affect also the fishery. So that would be a example, there are many others. I think also there's quite an interesting study done by the WWF, WWF and the Boston Consulting Group, where they make the business case for such a legally binding agreement. And perhaps Marco could enlighten a bit more about that, where they outline also that if you steer, if you give clear guidance, then this is also create new kind of businesses and not absolutely reduce the trade but shift perhaps the trade to a more sustainable product than plastic or in a better way. There's also been the question of all kinds of alternatives, biodegradables was one example. I'm not a technical expert, but what I think what we discussed a lot also internally in our office is we have to have a lot of knowledge about alternatives. Um, sometimes I think also the larger public is we are well aware of certain aspects of the plastic pollution. There are single-use plastic is a very one because we know that from our daily life, daily lives. But we have to be sure if we replace it, that alternatives are better, more environment, environmentally sound. And I think there we have to a lot, a lot of from the, the side of the, the policy makers to communicate, to really inform about what is the main issues and to make sure that the alternatives are better ones. And perhaps also in this regard, um, that I think it's also very important that the public knows where is well aware about that, and also that business can can know. And I think always a key issue for business, and we have also talked about trade, is that they there's a stable legal framework so that they know what will come up. I think also when you have clear guidance, when you have clear laws on a national level, then also business can adapt, can adjust. There might also be a field for for innovation, for new business coming up. I think when it's more difficult is if it's not clear the guidance, if something is to expect it to become, but we don't know what is coming. I think there we can also do a lot to have a clear legal framework, then also that will provide new business opportunities. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Felix. Very, very important words indeed. And bringing business along, but also having the governance and, you know, we insist so much on this uh, as you know, that the environmental governance and the governance framework are key indeed when we want to uh, uh, support uh, sound environmental uh, developments. I will then go to the conclusion, uh, uh, which is really to, to thank uh, everyone for uh, uh, their participation, not only in this session, but also throughout these dialogues. I think this is a model uh, of, of engagement that the Geneva Environment Network uh, uh, would like to continue on other subjects as well, but definitely we will continue to engage on uh, this uh, plastic uh, and the plastic governance, the international governance around plastic that we want to push in the Geneva, the, uh, dans la Genève internationale, as we say here in Geneva, in international Geneva. Uh, it is an important uh, and key uh, uh, development. I, I will use what also Felix told us, uh, how much uh, uh, the journey, the journey that we have taken uh, since 15 or 20 years, it's an incredible journey that leads us today to uh, thinking that a global agreement is uh, reachable, is feasible, and that uh, there's enough uh, uh, willingness around the globe to to do that. This is a really a different world than 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 in the early 2000s, and uh, this is because uh, a number of actors including in the panelists and including in your governments have, and, and, and stakeholders, civil society have 
made noise around this issue, uh, have, have taken action, and now that we've got the science uh, proving what can be done and what should be done, let's not uh, waste time, let's take political action and get to this agreement. On this, I would like to thank you uh, once again and wish you uh, a good day further and a good end of the week.